there's a tremendous power potential in geothermal using the Tesla turbine since it can ingest solids and it's just gone through extensive testing we've been in the process of confirming this technology for over 10 years mm, okay. since uh, 1989 we became involved with the turbine and it's been we've been pursuing the truth the uh, Tesla Engine Builders Association. You can go to the web and go to teslaengine.org. 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 Okay. That'll tell you all about it. You can go there and get a list of our back issues, our membership options, and what we've been up to. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's durable. It, it uh, you know, lasts longer. It's far less prone to, I guess, the, the effects of corrosion and stuff, right? That normal turbines are. So you, right. you pump the slurry right. with this and... This, and the, the problem with the geothermal potential that we have is it's completely contaminated. You can sink a deep well and virtually come up with the, with, with the pressure you need directly out of the ground, but it's full of solids, salt brine, salts, solids of all sorts, and, and you can't put that through a conventional turbine. Mm. Yeah, no, and, one you mentioned was salt and sea, but... Salt and sea. Yeah, maybe it, even like Wyoming probably has stuff, all that kind of... It's all across the world. The other, the other uh, thing that's exciting is that even our current power plants, our current peaking power plants, they're made by commercially by Toshiba. They, they use water for half of their fuel, as unbelievable as that might sound. Modern turbines can use water for half of their fuel, so it's very advantageous to run these turbines when half your fuel mass can be water and essentially doubles your fuel efficiency. But there's one problem with bladed turbines and these peaking plants is that they have to use reverse osmosis water. Again, there can be no solids inside the turbine. Contaminated water would represent solids even though it's what we would consider clean water. It's not clean enough for a bladed turbine. So that, that lowers your flow rate then? Well, no, what it does is it completely damages the blades. Oh no, I meant the, to, to osmosize the water to purify it, right? Well, no, they store it in a day. The reverse osmosis process takes place over days and days when the plant is in standby and they fill a big, huge tank. Next to that sits a huge tank of the same size full of diesel, or they have the option of running on natural gas. But when they run out of water, they have to stop. And typically what you'll see at a peaking plant is if the event occurs long enough where they need that peak power and they run their water tank dry, they'll bring in a series of stainless steel tankers and they line up at the gate to deliver the, the necessary essential water. With the Tesla turbine, you could simply uh, stick the hose down in the creek and uh, get the dirtiest water that is available. Mm, okay, because it can run off stuff that's not clean. So, it can, so that brings your fuel cost for your, for your fuel down by half because reverse osmosis water costs as much as the fuel that they use or more. So when you get a free fuel now, you, the cost of those peaking plants comes down to the point where they no longer have to be peaking plants because now they can run all the time because the efficiency just jumped up to make them economic to have on the grid at all times, which reduces the need for new, uh, new uh, power generation capabilities and keeps the total cost down. Well, now, does the Tesla turbine also have kind of micro power applications? Uh, the, the Tesla turbine definitely has micro power applications. As a matter of fact, with the right R&D, it could be employed into an automobile. And it has the unique feature that it's the safest type of turbine and also the cheapest. And this is what's kept turbines out of vehicles. Now with this revolution in turbines, which is only 100 years old, by the way, this is the 100th year anniversary. Oh, yeah. From 1906 to 2006. So we've, we've not come a long way in 100 years, but Tesla predicted that the progress would need to be slow. But the progress has been slow, and but in 1985 or so, in the mid-80s, the, the device became commercialized by the oil companies, and it's one of their premier devices they use now. But they use it in the pump mode. You can either use a pump as an engine or an engine or, or as a pump, and the same thing applies here. And, and as a pump, it just outperforms any other kind of pump, and as a result, the oil industry is standardized on them for difficult pumping. They can't use anything else. They have to use a Tesla. Now, you've, you've said also that before they standardized on these, they were replacing standard turbines at a rate of one every right. what, several days? Right. It depends upon or? what material that we're pumping, but it could be one day operation, even just several hours for some very nasty materials. Mm. But the Tesla turbine can pump these. They have a high vapor pressure, meaning that they'll boil at low temperature. And when a pump sucks on that low vapor pressure fluid, it boils inside the pump. And in a conventional bladed turbine, when you have boiling inside the pump, the blades come along, pop the bubbles, and you have implosions. And those implosion forces are generate temperatures 
equivalent or higher than that that you'll find on the sun. So they eventually dig away even the hardest steel blades. And as they dig away, they become less efficient. So bladed turbines become very inefficient over their operating life if they're in difficult service. With a Tesla turbine, has the same efficiency in the beginning and in the end. It does not experience anywhere whatsoever. Typically, oh, okay. Or very minimal. Is that because it has a sheen of water that's it's, adhering to it? It's because it doesn't operate by impulse. Its standard turbine operates by pressure against the blade. This turbine has no blade, so there is no impulse or reaction as we would typically find in a oh, okay. conventional turbine. Okay. It works by adhesion and viscosity. If you take a drop of water and put it on a kitchen plate, you'll notice it doesn't just drop right off the plate, it adheres to the plate. And it and also adheres to each itself. That's called viscosity. So this turbine works by the principle of adhesion and viscosity instead of the normal. And that's what gives you this it gives it this entirely different character and a, and it, and it opens up new realms to us. Tesla was so excited about this technology because he realized it could recover with low, weight, low energy waste heat. And he called it, an, he called it uh, uh, we're exploring a new world, the world of waste. Yeah. And we still have that world and much more so. At our, at our landfills, for instance, the, all kinds of waste heat is being poured off, which could be captured by a, a turbine like this. And that is typically corrosive methane that a standard turbine is damaged by. This turbine could be used without damage, making landfills much more economic to generate power from. I mean, we obviously don't need nuclear with all of its associated problems when we have all these options. But Well, in terms of, the, I mean, the thing that intrigued me was I, I had never heard of being able to pump geothermal like this before. And, and you said that it has multiple times what the United States needs in terms of available energy, being able to do right. this. Right. Geothermal represents a tremendous potential with this technology. Matter of fact, we have, we have all the documents done by previous researchers showing the feasibility if we would just act. Uh, the late Jake Passell did extensive research, although he never did actually... Uh, he did build a test turbine that was that was sunk in the oil fields. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, they, had, they actually did test the fact that they could run 80% solids to the turbine without damage. Also, just recently, the Energy and Environmental Research Lab in Grand Forks, North Dakota, tested the turbine with biomass, and it simply amazed them that this turbine would survive under 100% biomass combustion byproducts going through it. A typical turbine can only tolerate 20, and then only for a short 20% solids, and then only for a short time, and it will experience damage to the point of uselessness. Now, is there a limit to the particulate size of the solids? Is that a limiting factor? I mean, you couldn't well, use this as a small chopper. Small solids are just as dangerous as large solids. And that's what typically they have to worry about: is the small, very small solids, the ones that are not easily filtered. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask my my father-in-law works at a chopper pump company, yeah, but it's a little different application. They pump sewage, and they have just Oh, it's an excellent sewage pump. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. It can, it can pump solids. As a matter of fact, it's been used to pump live goldfish. It can pump concrete. It can pump any kind of high viscosity fluid without shear. You know, it doesn't, when you pump something with a high viscosity, it tends to stick together and the blades come along and rip it or shear it. This turbine does not shear the material. It comes through undamaged. Oh, okay. Okay. So it has great applications there. And so for, for pump, shear yeah. sensitive applications.